Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Eric Jenden. I'm uh, the professor and chair at Mount Sinai in New York City. And today I'm gonna speak to you a little bit about the indications and some of the outcomes for transoral robotic surgery. I wanna welcome you all uh, to the course. Um, instead of uh, really doing a data heavy discussion on the outcomes, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on talking about the indications and how we practically, realistically go about determining um, you know, which patients should be considered for surgery and, and maybe which patients would, would be better served with non-surgical therapy. Um, there's a, a lot of nuance in this and it's not as easy as it always seems. It's the probably the most significant discussion I have with our fellows uh, in making these decisions. But I really want at the end of the discussion for you to walk away and at least have a framework for kind of how do you approach patients and determine really who may be a good candidate for uh, robotics and who may not. You know, we, we tend to divide patients um, into one of these three categories. The far left is the really early disease with very little nodal um, burden, uh, small tumors. The far right is the, the very extensive disease with matted nodes, uh, large tumors. And then there's this gray area. And that's sometimes where we spend a lot of our time in terms of trying to determine which way a patient would benefit in terms of therapy. The two to four nodes, the two to four centimeter tumors, uh, maybe the tumor that encroaches on the palate, you know, is that a contraindication? Um, what are the factors that should go into making that decision? And, and, and a good example is if you look at this radiograph, this is a 2.3 uh, or so centimeter um, neck mass. Um, and the radiographic report reads this as a cystic neck mass um, 2.3 centimeters. Um, and, and that would sound like a, an easy chip shot type of surgical approach. But if you look carefully, you'll see here that there's dissemination and changes in the soft tissue that may or may not represent extra capsular spread. It may represent inflammation, but it doesn't really, um, pour, it's not as well portrayed on the straightforward reading uh, from your radiologist. So not every mass and not every tumor um, is exactly as it may be depicted on our radiograph or report. And you really got to look at this stuff carefully. And, you know, when we sit with patients, it's really an element of shared decision making where you are educating a patient on their disease and their options for treatment. And they are exchanging with you information to demonstrate that they understand what, what it is you're relating to them. And it's critically important that it is a two-way discussion and you really have a good understanding of the goals of that patient, their concerns, um, and the nuance of, of making decisions related to care. Because uh, like it or not, we have a tremendous amount of influence on our patients in terms of their treatment approach. Um, you could spend a, a good deal of time talking to a patient about the morbidity of surgery. Uh, here, this patient has an 11th nerve that's out, um, hemorrhage, um, difficulty swallowing and convince a patient um, that they really should go with non-surgical therapy. In contrast, um, you could tell a patient about the horrible side effects and toxicity of radiotherapy in a way such um, that they would choose surgery. So you as a, a surgeon uh, have a tremendous amount of impact and influence on patients and you have to use that very carefully um, as to consider the influence that you're going to have on the decision-making process. And, and when it comes to robotics, you know, um, now having been uh, around for quite some time, you know, when this first came out, we, we had exuberance over this and that, that hype cycle where, you know, every case and every patient was, was one that should be treated with robotic surgery um, was then met with the kind of this trough of disillusionment where, um, maybe it wasn't for everybody. Maybe there were some limitations and we're slowly come along the slope of enlightenment to somewhere settling in the middle. Um, robotic surgery, you know, it's an instrument just like any other instrument and, and its unique role has been accelerated because of the HPV epidemic. But I think somewhere between the exuberance of robotics um, and the disillusionment that we've faced uh, in trying to apply it we've come to uh, middle ground. And I think that that's what's critical that you kind of get a sense for. 
you know, the the if you look here, you know, we, we tend to uh, traditionally look at a tumor um, and, and, and ask ourselves, you know, if I do surgery or radiation, what are the outcomes going to be um, oncologically, functionally? Uh, how am I going to impact their quality of life? What are my biases? You know, there are tumors uh, uh, that involve different structures that I feel confident I can remove. Um, and I may have a bias, uh, but not everybody feels that way. So there are individual physician and surgeon impacts. Some of us are looking at cost effectiveness and, and others um, weigh more heavily patient preference. Many patients will come in uh, very concerned about one treatment or the other for all kinds of reasons. They had a brother or a friend, but as we plateau our enthusiasm, tumor stage may not be the most important thing in making the decision, but there may be these other issues that we really have to very seriously consider as you evaluate a patient to determine maybe what's the best approach. So for example, this base of tongue tumor is a pretty, pretty much a chip shot for robotic surgery, but what would you do with a tumor that came up onto the palate like this? There are some that would say, hey, that's an indication for non-surgical therapy. And there's others who believe that the morbidity of palate destruction from radiotherapy uh, would justify a surgical approach and a reconstructive option could give a patient a better functional outcome. So there, you can look at this from any way you want and you may come up with different answers. The other issue is, is that you're gonna find a lot of conflicting data um, and we'll talk about this in just a second, um, but you know the oncological and functional outcomes, the quality of life and cost, you have to look at the, the literature carefully. You know, how did they measure the outcomes? How did they interpret those outcomes? And, and, and how do you weigh those outcomes? Uh, for some, on oncologic outcome may be important, but their quality of life is much more important. Their, their function, their swallowing is the most important. So assessing these and weighing these outcomes are, are really important. And you need to, to, to speak to the patients to get a sense of what that weight should be. A good example, you know, John D. Almeida put out this, this paper, really well written, looking at cost effectiveness of robotic versus chemo radiotherapy. And he said, listen, TORS is cost effective. Uh, and that was, that, that was really the conclusion of the paper, a very well done paper. But at the same institution, uh, Brian O'Sullivan, they're both at University of Toronto. You know, he did his assessment. He felt that RT had a, a higher probability of cost effectiveness. So, you know, this conflicting data, even at the, you, you know, at the same institution um, really highlights, you know, the, the conflict and how we interpret this um, and how we utilize it. Um, not um, unlike that, uh, Uma Duvuri at Pittsburgh wrote a very nice paper looking at the oncologic outcomes um, as well as the quality of life. And, and he felt like, look, oncologically, uh, radiotherapy and, and uh, chemotherapy have similar outcomes uh, to TORS, um, but he felt that long and short-term outcomes were better in the robotic um, group. And, you know, there's data out there that conflicts with that, where radiation is, is functionally better. So you can go on and on with a really uh, spirited um, discussion on the data but at the end of the road, it really boils down to what your clinical interpretation um, and discussions with the patient are going to yield. Um, a good example and another way to think about this is putting the patient at the center of your decision making, not the tumor. Um, here's a, a nice, you know, small base of tongue HPV positive tumor. Um, and, you know, the way that I approach these is I ask myself three or four really critical questions. Number one, if I do surgery on this patient, can I mitigate or reduce radiation in a way that's gonna positively impact the patient? So if I give this patient radiotherapy as a primary therapy, they're gonna treat the primary to 7,000 and they're gonna treat both necks. You can imagine in a 40 something or 50 something year old patient, there's a lot of long-term morbidity with that. But if robotically I can go and remove this and I believe I can get negative margins with minimal impact on the functional outcome, minimal impact on their quality of life, I can do the neck dissections and either if they're N1 or N0, not give radiotherapy, um, reserving it for salvage, or at least reduce the dose to 6,000 or even lower as some of the new studies are showing and, and protect the opposite neck. 
So if the opposite neck is negative um, pathologically, that patient will not need any radiotherapy to that neck. So if I can mitigate you know, or reduce radiation doses in a way that's gonna be uh, beneficial to the patient, that to me is a patient that may be indicated for robotic surgery. And only then do I start to ask myself the questions of what is the patient you know, really thinking of, uh, cost effectiveness, some of the other uh, peripheral issues. Um, so can I mitigate radiation or reduce? The other question I ask is, can I mitigate chemotherapy? Um, we know now that PET scanning is not the best way to pick up ECS, and sometimes it's only pathologically that we're able to determine whether a patient has extranodal extension or not. Um, and so if I am on the borderline, um, doing a neck dissection is a good way to obtain pathologic material that will guide me um, in treating the patient. N1 disease is very different if there's ECS present than if there isn't. And sometimes a simple neck dissection, which is low in morbidity, may give me the information to help me determine what's the best adjuvant therapy if it's even required for that patient. So if I think I can mitigate chemotherapy, that might be an indication for me to consider robotic surgery. And then finally, what's the impact on the patient functionally? Um, if, if I'm gonna do surgical therapy or embark on surgical therapy on a small tumor, base of tongue or tonsil, and it's gonna have minimal functional impact on that patient, but I think it's gonna have an important impact um, on the toxicity and functional impact, uh, 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 quality of life and the outcome, then I'll do it. But if the tumor is too large, where I think that I'm gonna impact that patient more adversely functionally than I would if I radiated them, that might be a patient who I don't do surgery on. So, so putting the patient in the center of this is very different than what, what our paradigm has been, which is putting the tumor and making decisions based on the tumor. If you put the patient in the center and ask yourself um, these three questions, can I mitigate or reduce radiation? Can I mitigate chemotherapy with surgery? And can I minimize functional morbidity if I embark on surgery? Those to me are critical questions that can help you determine what truly are the indications for robotic surgery. If you feel that your surgery is not going to change appreciably uh, the radiation, uh, chemotherapy, and may in fact negatively impact the functional uh, capacity of the patient, then you really probably want to rethink it and, and consider non-surgical therapy. So uh, hopefully this is helping you and has helped you in kind of thinking about this. Uh, many people have very different frameworks for approaching this. Um, this is by no means uh, the only way to go, uh, but it certainly has helped me to determine and, and honestly assess um, who I think I can help and, and who may be better served with non-surgical therapy. So thank you very much and I appreciate the time and, and good luck moving forward.